Today we will be talking about cell counting and what to consider when doing it. So I will give a short introduction before Martin will then um, continue and talk about accuracy and reproducibility, the, mo uh, the two most important pillars of cell counting. Uh, we will continue on then about talking about cell counting on the MaxCont analyzers and hopefully afterwards have a fruitful discussion with you. So cell counting, most of you are probably doing it. Um, that's why you joined our, our webinar today. Cell counting is being done in numerous uh, ways and also in numerous applications. Um, most importantly, it is done in clinical and cell manufacturing processes such as IPC, QC assays, cell product dosages or health monitoring. In a more broad spectrum, it's also being done uh, for cell-based assays, viability or apoptosis, or also proliferation and cytotoxicity assays, where you really need to know how many cells you put into the assay to have a qualified result at the end. The third one would be you also need cell counting for downstream applications, for example, cell sorting, transfection, or seeding of your cells, because also for this, you need to know how many you put in to perform your applications. There are numerous cell counting methodologies. The most commonly used ones are manual cell counting, um, for example, plating or CFU counting. The most predominantly used one is, however, the hemocytometer indicated here within the picture. It is the Neubauer's cell chamber, and it's used still up to day by about seven, in about 70% of all cell counting cases. However, there are a lot of ways uh, to introduce variability into this cell counting method, um, as it requires a lot of training and practice to get reproducible and accurate results with this method. Easier ways to get reproducible and accurate results for your assays are automatic cell counting methods, such as image-based technologies, impedance counting technologies, or low cytometry-based technologies. And these are what we are going to focus on today. So I will hand over to my colleague Martin, and he will continue talking about accuracy and reproducibility in cell counting with flow cytometry. So good morning and good evening also from my side. Um, so let's move on with uh, um, cell counting uh, in the context of flow cytometry. So first, I think it's important uh, uh, to talk briefly about a couple of important terms and desirable goals uh, that one wants to reach. Uh, in the first place, uh, when you do uh, measurements of all kinds, the terms that are uh, quite important in most of the cases is reproducibility and accuracy. Uh, in our case, in the uh, case of uh, doing cell counting, with MaxQuant flow cytometers, we can only claim precision and linearity. And there's a resemblance between these two terms here because precision and reproducibility is essentially the same. So what this means is if you repeat a measurement a couple of times, then you should always get the same result. This means the measurement is precise. Precise is therefore uh, synonymous uh, to reproducibility. If you have good, good reproducibility, you have good precision. Um, the other thing is linearity, which means in our case, if we have twice the number of cells in the sample, we're going to expect uh, that we also count uh, twice the number of cells in the experiment. That doesn't necessarily mean that there is a systematic error left, so it could well be that we only count 90% of the cells, but not 100%. Um, meaning uh, what we only claim is if there's double material in the sample, we count uh, 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 t twice the number of events. And if these two methods are given, uh, then in order to achieve good accuracy, one probably has to cross validate against a different technology, which is also something we are going to talk about later in this presentation. The other things, uh, besides the obvious one and the primary goals, uh, for, for many operators, people that are using automation to do things, what they're interested in is speed and efficiency. Uh, these are no primary properties of the counting method itself. It's more about uh, everything that's built around it. 
and in our case, I guess, I mean, as we are doing, uh, um, as, as we are uh, bringing flow cytometry devices to the market, we need to talk about uh, these effects here, uh, um, what this means uh, in the context of max quant flow cytometry here. And both of them are generally uh, a technology dependent in the max quant. What we do have is we have automated cell counting and automation built into the device, meaning the counting itself in the first place is volumetric. So we pick up a known volume and when we measure all the events in that known volume, we have a volumetric cell count. Uh, maintenance procedures around it like startup, shutdown and cleaning um, are also taken care of automatically by the system so that uh, one simply cannot forget uh, to do a maintenance procedures uh, towards the end of the workday. So the, the instrument is always kept in good shape, meaning this facilitates uh, reproducibility from that perspective. Sample labeling steps and processing steps uh, to the extent possible can also be automated, uh, meaning there is no or less um, error due to process variability. An automated process typically runs better than a manual process. Uh, same holds true for calibration and QC processes. Uh, whenever you start up the instrument in the morning, uh, you provide some calibration particles. The in instrument characterizes itself and it adjusts itself uh, to correct for any variability that may have occurred prolonged operation of the instrument. And then lastly, the counting itself. I mean, all the ones that are familiar with flow cytometry, they know uh, there's always in the analysis part the process of gating the cells. And sometimes it's difficult uh, to tell different populations apart. Uh, and uh, this is supported here with automated express mode analysis, um, where the knowledge about the possible distribution in a given measurement is entered into the program, meaning this ultimately facilitates uh, precision and reproducibility simply due to the fact uh, that for sure given that whenever you enter the same material twice, exactly the same measurement data, the analysis result will be exactly the same. Uh, and of course, this is uh, uh, what really means reproducibility. Because of all these automation uh, of, uh, functionalities in the device, as a direct consequence, this whole thing is easy to use. You simply select the cells you're interested in, the cocktail you're interested in, and then the instrument takes care of everything else. The only thing that has to be given and to be precisely uh, prepared by the operator is uh, putting the right amount of cells uh, into the tubes so that they can be measured. The whole thing is designed for consistency, meaning the linearity I was talking about before is given over three orders of magnitude. What this means in detail is going to be uh, presented in the following slide. Uh, and the other thing, um, the calibration process uh, makes sure that data that was acquired on one instrument would be acquired pretty much the same way on another instrument because uh, the instruments set themselves up to be comparable um, so that all the instruments that are sitting next to each other or even in different labs uh, would produce the same results uh, from the same starting material. So to the extent possible, the uh, instrument to instrument variability is taken out of the game. And lastly, for the max quant, uh, we use a pump syringe system to drive the sample through the flow cell and the pump itself is relatively precise. A full stroke of the plunger is built into it is 500 microliters, but these 500 microliters are separated into 24,000 individual steps, meaning a, a single step is much less than one microliter uh, in volume. And this is defining the precision and the in this case, the accuracy of the, uh, the, the volumetric process itself. And then it also facilitates speed. So for example, on the MaxQuant Analyzer X, a 96 well plate can be processed uh, within 15 minutes. And because of an effect that we are also going to discuss later, uh, keeping the measurement time short helps in getting reproducible results. I can say uh, when we look back to our list of desired goals, um, automation uh, ensures quick results, ease of use. Automation, I think, <laughs> has been discussed. Uh, the whole thing is in a multi-parametric environment. Of course, flow cytometry uh, um, can also not only enumerate uh, cells at all, you can also phenotype them at the same time. And 
what we are mainly interested again, and this is really the difficult part about it, uh, this is what's now here in this box, precision and linearity. And I was promising you before that we are going to talk about these aspects in more detail, and this is uh, coming now. So I said before, precision is when we do the same measurement again and again, what, what one would expect is getting the same results again and again. And an easy way to do it in the application of cell counting is divide a sample up in mul into, into multiple tubes and measure them one after the other. And here in this particular example, as, as being, being shown here, th this is a very typical result. Uh, we have split uh, peripheral blood mononuclear cells uh, um, into 16 different tubes. And uh, uh, we're doing counting results here and the cell count in all those measurements as you can see, was highly reproducible. Uh, so always getting more or less uh, this, the same count from all the tubes uh, that have been measured here. And in fact, the CV of these numbers here um, happens to be 1.5%. And this is a very typical result that one can expect from a properly working instrument. And in the data sheet, we claim uh, that for typical measurement, this value is below 5%, meaning to what we claim they can do and if it's 5%, I think this is what's ultimately desired and a very technical definition of a an, of an possible uh, coefficient of variation. Linearity. Uh, linearity essentially means if you expect twice the number of cells in the sample, you, want to cause, you, you actually want to get twice the count. Or the other way around, if you expect half the number of cells in the sample, um, you expect um, uh, to receive half the count. And a relatively simple and straightforward way to do it is uh, carrying out a dilution series. So what one would do is one starts with a, with a certain cell concentration and then dilute it down by subsequent steps uh, of diluting by a factor of two. If this is going to happen, and if one would plot the dilution against the, uh, the resulting count, what one would expect on a log a diagram as, as seen here is a perfectly a straight, straight line. As you can see here, it, from from one to one, which is the highest concentration, down to elution, uh, a, a dilution of one in 2048. This line is pretty close to perfection, meaning as linear as it can be. And uh, a dilution of one to thousand uh, would mean uh, this is exactly three orders of magnitude. Uh, so therefore, this is why we claim that the, uh, the linearity is given over more than uh, three orders of magnitude. Um, this is not always the case. So, for example, we have taken a reference instrument on the market uh, that's accepted for, um, for cell counting in clinical environments. Uh, it's an impedance-based cell counter here, uh, and we have repeated the same dilution series uh, on this particular device. And even though for the moment we do not know exactly uh, um, whether this value is the same, this is what we are going to look at a little later, but what we can see it is generally also following the straight line as in the diagram before. Um, so this point here is defining the slope of the line, but already here it starts slightly to deviate. And here the deviation uh, from perfect uh, linearity is a little more. Then it jumps back to linearity, keeps being linear uh, down to here and then starts to deviate again uh, uh, on the curve. The explanation why that is is this particular instrument is actually not capable of doing linear counting over multiple orders of magnitude. And this is why the, the vendor of this particular device has introduced uh, two different modes of measuring the sample. So there's the, uh, the, the regular mode. This is where you collect these values above here. And then there's a pre-dilution mode and the pre-dilution mode kicks in from this value on. Uh, and this is why here, there's this deviation here on this particle and no deviation here on this particle. Uh, therefore, this is an interesting guy here. And we would say from the highest value down to a concentration of um, a dilution of one to eight, this is where the linear range of this particular device is. And you cannot expect uh, reliable results beyond that point until you change the mode uh, between, the, uh, between the two different devices. So maybe just one word again on um, why a dilution series is uh, so nice to perform, because there is simply no material dependency that plays a role. 
I mean, dilution is something that everyone can do and where you're exactly sure, you know, if you diluted the sample by a factor of two with clean water or clean buffer, um, then actually this total cell number in the sample should be the same. And therefore, you know, if it's twice the volume, you get half the count. The, so this takes many of variabilities and questions about the ground truth out of the game, simply because you know the linearity here is as good as the precision of your pipetting is. There's a different way one can draw these results uh, um, because one can also draw the volume that's being measured against the count that one would get. And of course, this again should be linear. Um, and here in this diagram, uh, what we can see here is uh, we were picking 100 microliters of sample and getting a cell count uh, about 800,000 uh, cells that's, uh, that, that have been present in these 100 microliters. Here we are looking at 50 microliters and as expected, we get slightly more than uh, 400,000 uh, cells in the sample. Uh, and again, 25 microliters, uh, uh, we're slightly above uh, 200. Again, we would expect a perfectly straight line and this is exactly what we see here. Then of course there is another way of drawing it, uh, especially if we have two instruments in comparison. Here we are measuring the measured volume and drawing the measured volume against uh, the concentration that was reported by the instrument. And of course the concentration that's reported should be totally independent uh, uh, from the measured volume. And here we have three repeats. Uh, this is where the error bars are coming from. Uh, and what we see here is 100 microliters, uh, we get a certain cell concentration from the sample. At 50 microliters, uh, uh, we get exactly the same cell concentration on the sample. 25 microliters, we get the same cell concentration. 20 microliters, 15, 10, and 5 microliters. And as one can see here, at 5 microliters, uh, uh, the curve here is, 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 is deviating from perfection. This was barely visible in the plot that we have looked at on the page before. Uh, but well below 20 microliters, uh, um, the line here in this diagram from here to here um, is pretty horizontal and this is what it's supposed to be. So, and therefore we can say uh, the volumetric accuracy is also given on this particular device and this is proven by, uh, uh, by this particular measurement. And then there is one more uh, uh, question we could ask ourselves, and this is how do these two instruments compare? Uh, that we were looking at uh, uh, the uh, flow cytometer and the impedance-based cell counter here. And what we are drawing here is, this again has been the measurement from the impedance-based cell counter here, uh, uh, drawn in exactly the same way um, as the flow cytometry data here. And now we can draw these two uh, um, these two uh, instruments against each other. So on the x-axis here, we do have the count as uh, the, the, the cell concentration as reported by the max quant flow cytometer. And on this axis here, uh, we have the count as being reported uh, by the, uh, by the impedance-based cell counting device. And now we know from the max quant alone, we would expect a perfectly straight line when we draw these uh, to each other, kind of as expected, what we see here is uh, that there's mismatch between the two instruments here and starting to occur here again. Uh, the other numbers here are, um, are pretty much on, 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 the, on the straight line. This is as expected. The interesting question uh, here would now be, what is actually the slope of the line itself? Uh, because this, defines the discrepancy between these two instruments. And it turns out, if we do a regression here on the instrument, the formula we get is the y-axis, the count by the impedance-based cell counters, is 1.085 times the count uh, reported by the max quant, meaning the two instruments are deviating in cell count by 8.5%. Um, and this is now, um, so what limits the overall accuracy, because based on the measurement principle, there is a deviation between the instrument. In this case, it's pretty systematic. So we can actually say whenever we want to correlate data that was acquired on the impedance-based cell counter and the uh, max quant flow cytometer, either we take the data from the impedance-based cell counter and divide it by 1.085, 
or we take the data from the max quant flow cytometer and multiply it by 1.085. And in either case, uh, uh, from that point on, um, the, the numbers by these two instruments um, are directly comparable with the exception that there's few graphs in the system where the impedance-based cell encounter simply cannot follow. So with that said, um, I think I referenced to it a couple of times. Sometimes it's difficult to understand the ground truth in an experiment. So for example, um, I mean, generally one would first lens, one would say counting is a super simple application because every child has learned it in, a, in, in uh, their early days. I mean, you take one piece out of a basket uh, and you count one, and then you take the next pe uh, piece out of the basket, uh, you increment the counter to two, and you repeat it until the basket is empty. Uh, uh, but now let's let's consider uh, sort of if the the uh, artifacts we want to count are tomatoes. Um, one thing that could happen is maybe the basket was dropped and some of the tomatoes were falling out of the basket. Um, the basket was overfilled. Some tomatoes were falling out of the basket, and you never know what happens to the tomatoes on the bottom. Um, and in some cases, you may even have a situation that the operator does something to the tomatoes. And afterwards, it's going to be difficult uh, to estimate the exact number of tomatoes that were being present uh, in this particular application. So they could be smashed, they could be squeezed. Um, and in the case of cells, things that can easily happen is uh, some cells may interact with other cells in the reagent tube. Or cells could stick to the walls in the reagent tube. There could be pipetting errors. C cells could simply sediment. This is one of the bigger things we are going to discuss. And in particular, sedimentation, of course, is an effect um, that plays a role on the time scale of minutes. Uh, and this is something we're going to show you. And also another thing we're going to show you that this is particular to a given material. Uh, and in order to prove that principle, we came up with a material mix. So we mixed uh, uh, beads, 0.5 micrometer, 0.9 micrometer, 3 micrometers, uh, uh, PBMCs, stained with uh, uh, CD45 Fitzy fluorochrome, and hex cells in a mixture, meaning the starting suspension is a, 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 a mixture where all these materials are present in the relatively same amounts. And then we were trying to measure 10 microliters, 33 microliters, 100 microliters, and 333 microliters of the same sample um, at low flow rate in the instruments and doing measurements in triplicates. So if all the materials are behaving exactly the same, what one would expect is uh, getting always the very same results. And as one might expect, um, I wouldn't show this experiment if this would be the case. Um, there, there are differences, uh, but first let's have a quick look at the gating strategy here. Uh, there is a, a, a scatter plot, um, forward scatter here on this axis, side scatter here on, on, on this axis. Uh, and, uh, and what we do see here is we have the small particles, 0.5 micrometer particles, 0.9 micrometer particles, 3 micrometer particles, uh, the, the cells from the PBMC. Uh, and the hex cells as the largest ones. The hex cells here are now pretty much sticking to the edge of this diagram, but since we only want to count them, this is okay. Uh, and we have taken focus here that we can measure in the same measurement and tell them apart the hex cells as large as these guys, but at the same time are being able to look at the 0.5 micrometer beads in, in, in the same diagram. And this is why, we've, why we have chosen to go on a log scale. And one can clearly see that all these population, populations can be, uh, um, can be identified uh, distinctly so that we are pretty sure in the following analysis, um, the results are not coming from the fact that we were not able to gate on the cells of interest. And uh, what one starts to see time course of the measurement. So what's drawn here on the x-axis here is measurement time. And on the y-axis is uh, the count rate, if you will. 
And what you see here is for 100 microliter measurements, it looks pretty much the same for all the three materials. So the small beads, the lymphocytes, uh, and the large hex cells, we, we get uh, a more or less the, the same the same measurement course, time course. Um, it looks pretty much the same. Here, well, it's still almost the same, but if we go for the small measurements here, in this case, 10 microliters, towards the end of the measurement, we do see a difference. So the measure measurement in, in this case here was uh, about uh, uh, 25 seconds long. And after about 20 seconds, the largest particle started to drop in counting. Followed um, shortly later by the lymphocytes, whereas at the same time, the small particles, uh, they kept had, uh, they were keeping their flow rate uh, until the very end of the measurement. And the reason for this behavior in this case is sedimentation. Now what one can do is one can separate the sample into three different sections. So we have the starting section, which is the first third of the measurement. Then we have a middle section uh, where we look at the distribution and then we have the end section. Um, and as expected from this diagram, what one would actually see is that towards the end of the measurement, uh, the hex cells are dropping uh, and the PBMCs are dropping as well. Whereas at 30 microliters, um, or 100 microliters, uh, measurements are not so much affected by this effect. Meaning, we can clearly see the behavior is different and distinct on a per cell base, uh, um, um, on, a, on a per cell type base. So if we would do a calibration with 33 microliters, we could expect the, um, um, the, the, um, the cell count being relatively independent from hex cells and PBMCs, whereas due to very small volumes, uh, the material dependent effect here coming from the two different cell types is no longer neglectable. Um, and therefore, we would say for an accurate and reproducible cell count over the, um, over the full volume, uh, it's given after um, after a certain amount, and one can do all the measurements, but there is material-specific differences uh, between the different measurements. And simply to prove that this was not just random, that this was really material-specific, uh, what we have shown here in this diagram is the different, uh, different materials, 0.9 micrometers be uh, beats uh, here, 10 microliters, 33 microliters, 100 microliters here. PBMCs in a second diagram and hex cells in a third diagram. And in all cases here, we do see that the event rate uh, drops early towards the end of the measurement, whereas the small particles, uh, they stay at uh, comparable levels uh, uh, throughout the course of the measurement and the PBMCs are um, uh, somewhere in between. So this we take as the proof that the effect that we have seen really is material specific and not, ju not just arbitrary or instrument specific. Uh, to summarize this up to this point here, we can now say uh, what are our lessons learned? Well, first of all, different cells, they may behave differently. Uh, for the most part, I have proven this with sedimentation, but it's uh, quite obvious that this, of course, can also happen due to cell-cell interactions like antigen-specific cells and antigen-presenting cells. They may lack each other better uh, than cells that have no interest in each other at all. Um, and only the very small particles, they really behave li like the liquid. And this ultimately limits uh, uh, what's physically doable in the instruments. And as we have proven here before, the small particles that are measured, they are constant throughout the course of the measurement from the very beginning to the very end. Um, and therefore, this is what the hydraulics of the system can do. And if cells then sediment or decide to do things differently, um, there is no easy physical process around it. Uh, and another consequence of this is there is absolutely no universal way to correct for all the issues uh, that are material dependent. Or you could take it in other terms. So if you have counting beads that again have a distinct behavior, if the counting beads are perfectly calibrated to give precise results for mo monocytes, say they would, 
uh, then for sure they are off by a small margin for TMB cells. And simply to uh, um, elaborate be, um, a little more on, uh, um, on the sedimentation aspect, we also wanted uh, uh, to highlight another effect because what we have seen so far is sedimentation that was happening within the measurement process while we are measuring. So uh, things that are happening in the tubing, in the flow cell, uh, um, on the way from the cells out of the tube into the instrument. Uh, but of course, there is also sedimentation that's going to happen in the tube before the cells are actually reaching the measurements. And we have set up a very simple experiment here. We have taken a uh, lysed whole blood stained with CD45 Bio Blue, um, used the fixed measurement volumes in multiple tubes, uh, 45 microliters. Uh, we're setting the system up to medium flow rate so that it's relatively quick. Uh, no mixing between, no resuspension between, uh, uh, between the tubes, cells that were not measured are kept at four centigrades and at every time point uh, uh, tri triplicates were measured. Um, and the time points we were looking at is um, right after preparation, after uh, um, two minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, 45 minutes and 60 minutes. Uh, and no surprise, when you prepare the cells, measure them directly, what you get is a relatively high cell count and the uh, uh, coefficient of variation is relatively small. So the error bars uh, um, coming from the triplets, the highest count was here. Average count is this, lowest count um, is almost within the, uh, within the circle. So it's as precise as one would expect. But even after waiting for five minutes, keeping the cells in the fridge for five minutes, and again, not mixing and resuspending them, cell count drops by about 20% in this particular case. And within the measurement, you can actually see first measurement, second measurement, third measurement. Uh, and then again, after 10 minutes, the, uh, the uh, average count is even lower. After 15 minutes, the average count is even lower. Um, and this goes on until we are reaching about 30 minutes and then the cell count stays roughly constant because what's happening here is all the cells were sedimented in the tube, uh, were uh, kept at the bottom. Um, and after the sedimentation process is more or less completed, uh, we could expect uh, the cell count not to vary uh, further. And therefore, we can definitely say for reproducible results, we need to lock down the full timing. And the full timing in this particular case, case means timing uh, that includes uh, a, a sample preparation from the very beginning. Again, we have shown the effect of sedimentation, but other cell-cell interactions may happen uh, over time as well. Uh, but also mixing, and of course, one would not do the experiment the way I have demonstrated uh, here a second ago. One would use resuspension. But clearly, again, if you keep cells in suspension and the cells don't touch each other or don't see each other, they don't interact as much as they would if they're all sedimented down in a, in a, in a, in a cluster of cells. Uh, um, and also the interaction with the, the tube walls um, is more likely if the cells are sedimented to the bottom of the tube and it won't be as much uh, if the cells are kept in suspension. Therefore, we would generally say it's always better to keep cells in suspension rather than resuspending them right before the measurement. And again, uh, keep timing aspects as constant and as similar for all the cells uh, uh, th that you are looking at. And then uh, for a couple of reasons and also for the effect that I have shown in the beginning, the measure mode itself also has an effect because some cell types, uh, they maybe have different in the tubing while they're in the system uh, and therefore measure mode and flow rate uh, should also be kept, uh, be kept constant and locked down Otherwise, it's not so easy to compare results directly. Uh, yeah, and this brings me more or less to the uh, a summary. I want to thank you for your attention.